Altoona, home of the world-famous Horseshoe Curve. In 1849, construction began on the steam locomotive manufacturing shops in Altoona, Pennsylvania at 12th Street. After construction of the Horseshoe Curve in 1854, freight traffic east and west via the railroad increased dramatically. This created a need for more steam locomotives and additional shop facilities. Four new shops were built in the village of Juniata and in use by 1889. The first new steam locomotive was manufactured and produced by the shops in 1891. The expansion of the shops continued over the ensuing years, creating the largest steam locomotive facility in the world, employing over 15,000 people, many of whom emigrated to Altoona from all over Europe. Our present workforce is comprised of many descendants of these emigrants. With the advent of the diesel-electric locomotive in the late 1940s, the need for shop capacity diminished as steam was replaced with diesel. Closing and consolidation of the shops began and continued throughout the years with the Pennsylvania Railroad, Penn Central, and Conrail. We are still located on the original site, with 17 acres under roof situated on 500 acres. In 1981, Conrail completed a $30 million consolidation and modernization of the Juniata shops to service, repair, and remanufacture diesel-electric locomotives and their associated components. Over 100 years of development and successful manufacturing remanufacturing history have led Conrail to market this knowledge and expertise to other railroads. Our highly skilled craftsmen are capable of providing you with the same cost-effective, reliable locomotives and components utilizing the latest quality control methods and standards as we now do for Conrail. Conrail's Juniata locomotive shops offer the full capability to perform complete engine rebuilds, engine generator truck replacements, complete locomotive rebuilding, modifications, and wreck repair. Conrail's Juniata Remanufacturing Service will take pride in being your choice for locomotive and component repairs. Our quality production begins with skilled craftsmen. The dedication of our people in using their skills to the utmost has helped forge the Conrail success story. Our craftsmen, provided with the most advanced equipment and procedures, guarantee continued success, from electronic control card repair to complete GE and EMD locomotive remanufacturing. Conrail's Juniata locomotive shops give you unparalleled capabilities. Our program includes specialized workstations consisting of material handling, customized cleaning operations, computer-controlled warehousing, superior insulation application, environmentally compliant painting, combined freight car and locomotive air brake room, machine tool shop, and custom equipment testing. Each contributes to a working facility that permits us to accommodate the most demanding customer ourselves. In a prior video, we got to sit in the engineer seat of a former Santa Fe Warbond at Dash 944 CW number 639. That red handle to the right is the automatic brake valve handle which releases and applies the brake. The black handle on the left is the reverser which unlocks the throttle. It has three positions, neutral where it is right now, forward and reverse. The black handle in the middle is the power throttle which has positions which you might call speeds numbers 1 through 8 and also the idle position. Pushing the power throttle forward of notch 1 puts you in a dynamic brake application zone which is used for retarding the train on gradients. In another locomotive, a Canadian National EMD SD75i to be exact, we see the traditional setup of these same exact controls. Same functionality, just placed differently. EMD also offers the desktop style controls, but in the early days of wide cabs, desktop controls were extra cost options on both GE and EMD. Power moves or light engine moves where several operational and non-operational locomotives are ferried from one place to another. Sometimes these moves are standalone special symbol trains and sometimes they move in the consist of regularly scheduled freights. I've caught a handful of these moves over the past few years. The first one was on July 20, 2017 when sole power for train 962 made a U-turn on the Steamtown Wide to head up to Binghamton, long hood forward. I thought it was quackery at first but changed my tune real quick when that same Norfolk Southern number 2740 came gliding down the mountain several hours later with locomotives in tow, probably bound for Enola. 
The good news for us is that it took the siding at Taylor for what would become a three-train meet. In our merry, brave new world of PSR, a running engine is an engine more expensive than it needs to be. Since a diesel electric can be towed as many miles as needed, unlike a car with an automatic transmission, the rest of a power balancing consist will be at the very least isolated and probably shut down. Locomotives are moved for many reasons, taking recently shopped engines to outlying locations for use as well as bringing defective or 92-day form engines to shops for the required 92-day general inspections is another reason. The western roads seem to have a penchant for major moves of motive power. Sometimes they don't even bother with the trains. It's just a bunch of locomotives. And as often as they seem to appear, I suspect that some of the moves are simply repositioning moves or power balancing moves. On January 6th, we caught the train 960 with the Lackawanna Heritage Unit leading a light power move going westward out of Enola and toward Altoona with an additional five engines in tow, one of which was a new SD70 IAC. In November of 2017, we caught another 960 light power move in Piscataway, New Jersey. The stars of the show were a batch of BNSF GEs. On a night that I'm sure you'll remember, we caught a northbound 965 with an incredible mix of green and blue lease locomotives. And now here's where I get to laugh and say I told you so. Several people asked me, where are these engines going? And when I said to Albany, New York, I was regarded as a kook. Well, it turns out I was right. From Albany, the power went east onto the Pan Am Southern where another rail fan called 16th Avenue Studios stalked it for three days as it moved through New England.
I got word from a friend that the train 14R was getting close to town with an incredible 7-unit lash-up. Three Norfolk Southern diesels and four Canadian Pacific diesels, including a newly rebuilt AC44 CWM, bringing up the rear of the entourage. With today's super high horsepower modern day diesels and precision scheduled railroading, seeing more than two or three locomotives on any train is becoming harder and harder to come by. And if you do see more than two or three locomotives on one train, assuming it's not distributed power, there's a good chance that some of the locos will be isolated, offline, or dead in tow, often for fuel conservation purposes. The following is a little crash course about how locomotive power is assigned and regulated and gives a little insight about the different diesel ideologies of different railroads. Depending on the road, you may only be allowed a certain number of axles for dynamic braking. For example, on the BNSF in the late 1990s, 28 axles of dynamic braking was all that was allowed on certain trains. On that same note, they only allowed 36 axles of power on a train. By BNSF philosophy, any more than that could tear up the power, the train, or the track and even cause major problems if you go around a curve with too much power. The Union Pacific, during that same period, limited the BNSF to 21,000 horsepower over the Tehachapi route. These are just a small sampling of the thousands of operating rules that every railroad faces. nineteen forty built Elko HH six sixty, the DLW number four oh nine, returned to its home rails in Scranton on Wednesday, August twelfth, twenty twenty. The Genesee Valley Transportation Company bought the rare high hood Elko to restore and preserve at its DL base here in Scranton. The 409 was transported on the flat car instead of being towed in because the truck under the cab has friction bearings. This truck carries a patent from Canada that dates back to nineteen twenty five. The paint on the front number board on the engineer's side of the engine is peeling off to reveal its Erie Lackawanna number 324. The DL's Taylor Interchange train BR1 slash DL3 retrieved the 409 from Taylor Yard, which you may remember is a former Delaware Lackawanna and Western property itself. It was brought back to Steamtown and run over the Diamond Branch and the Strawberry Hill connecting track to the ex dnh main line where the Alco dock himself, Don Colangelo, brought it back to the Breck Street shops where a rigging company unloaded the local from the flat car. It's now at the new Von Storch Diesel shop in North Scranton. 